Welcome everybody to Dead Talk Live. I am your host, Viz, and today we are joined by writer-director Chris Van Hoffman, whose new movie, Devil's Workshop, premieres Friday, September 30th in theaters and video on demand. Chris, thank you for being our guest today. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm, uh, I'm happy to be on here. I've known about this for a while, and I'm happy to finally be a guest. Oh, it is our pleasure. And I, you know, like I said, just before we went live, I really enjoyed this film and I look forward to sort of breaking it down a little bit. So let's just get right to it. Devil's Workshop takes the career of a struggling actor uh, contacting a demonologist for just your normal research sake. Um, How did you land on the idea of using an actor in their career to bring in the character of a demonologist? Um, I, uh, I, yeah, I, I guess as far as like when the demonologist, I, I think the, the germ of it really came from, uh, I was pitching a t- a, an anthology TV show like back in 2017. And it was like kind of, you know, uh, Twilight Zone meets Entourage, and it was kind of like Hollywood horror. Um, and it never got off the ground, but uh, but we pitched it everywhere, and uh, and I had to like I was writing a bunch of different concepts, like log lines of like what what about this concept? What about this concept? What about that concept? And <clears throat> and I you know I don't know where the demonologist. I don't know. I was like thinking of like poltergeist, and I was just like thinking of like well, I haven't really done much of a supernatural kind of concept i was just kind of like throwing a bunch of spaghetti against the wall and this was just one that uh a lot of people seem to always highlight in the uh-huh. list of concepts and over and over and over people would always highlight this one because it was very makeable it was very simple um and it was very kind of interesting and uh and so it was one of those things where like if it stays with you year after year it must be a, a good thing to, to kind of pursue and and then um and then the year of 2019 was kind of a, a weird year for me professionally i had a movie that fell apart, which was kind of like a devastating process, uh, time. And, and I kind of had to sort of reinvent myself a little bit and, and, and write, you know, kind of go back to my roots and write something. Um, and I was like, all right, well, now's the time to, I think, write that script. Cause I think like, that's, that's the one that I'm going to be able to get made. Good. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and I'm, we're, we're very glad that you did. Is there a little bit of social commentary about the entertainment industry with uh, the actor, their career, the demonologist, and us finding out the demonologist also has sort of a background in entertainment as well. Uh, yeah, I guess like, um, yeah, like the themes of like, uh, I mean, <clears throat> you know, every all the principal characters in the movie are all actors themselves, um, uh, for better or for worse. And uh, and they've all had, you know, experience in that and in, in, in that field. And I mean, I, I think... Um, yeah, I mean, like, uh, yeah, I, I think I think people can certainly uh, poke, you know, poke, you know, dissect it and find uh, um, social commentary for sure. Like, refl- I mean, like a lot of my favorite films that uh, a lot of my favorite films are Hollywood satires. I mean, like one of my favorite films is a David Cronenberg movie called Maps to the Stars, mm-hmm. which um, a lot of people don't really talk about. But I, it might be actually my favorite film of his because I just seen it more than any of his other films. And I just am weirdly obsessed with that movie. And. And that movie is like, it's a Hollywood satire, but it's not like beating you over the head with it. It's no. not telling you it's a Hollywood satire. It's just kind of like, it's just like you're eavesdropping on all these people and it's just kind of hard not to. And, and that's exactly what, what Devil's Workshop does. It gives you a, it gives the audience a little bit of a slight peek behind the curtain of what actors have to do for researching, whether it's for auditions or after they booked the role for the part itself. Now, the dialogue between the two characters of Clayton and Eliza is very compelling. It's it's those two have some great conversations. What was it? What, is there was there any message that you were trying to convey with that you know very deep dialogue that happened throughout the film between those two characters? Um. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know necessarily about a message, but I think I think kind of, you know, uh, allowing you know, giving them the space to kind of like slowly kind of come together and uh, and and find like the, um, you know, find that they're both kind of you know, I, I I think what she's trying to do throughout the film is trying to like you know put them at ease, sort of soften them up for the blow, you know, uh, uh, for like you know, 
alluding to the end of the film and kind of you know allowing him to be relaxed uh, mm-hmm. throughout the film and and slowly because uh, they you know well you know when you have like a you know like a therapist you know like how they try to relax their patient as much as possible to get them to open up to you and I think that's kind of what she's she's uh, sort of like a demon doctor she's trying to extract these demons out of him and uh, and by doing that she has to get him to be relaxed and comfortable and um, as if he's talking to his own mother and uh, and so, hey, yeah, and, you know, like that was, pro- yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, you know, thinking back on it, the conversations, especially when he does start to reveal about his relationship with his mom, it is a lot like a doctor patient relationship. At yeah. least that's what it, it evolves into. Now, do you think Clayton sees this moment in his career? He's like 30 something as this is going to be my either make or break moment. And that's why he is so committed to doing what he does with Eliza. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, uh, I think, um, you know, like struggling actors, you know, I mean, you know, when you're, you know, cause there was a, a, a I mean, it was very important that the character of Clayton was in his thirties and not just in his thirties, in his mid thirties, you mm-hmm. know, and not like in his twenties because, being a struggling actor in your 20s versus being a struggling actor in your 30s is a very different kind of emotion. Yeah. And, uh, when you're in your 30s, I mean, you were legit, you, you were officially struggling. And, mm-hmm. um, and so, so yeah, I think when he's at, at that age and like, you know, I mean, Clayton's like not, you know, obviously he's a little, maybe he's like not the most stable person, um, but uh, just given his past. But, um, but yeah, I mean, like, I, I think, um, I, I think he's just at that point where he's like, you know what, this chick might be a lunatic, but I'm just going to say, you know, screw it. And I'm just going to go out there and, uh, and whatever happens happens and I'll spend the night here. I don't care. Like, I mean, cause like what he literally has nothing else to lose. So. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about Emil Hirsch's character, Donald, not a very likable character. No. <laughs> uh, what does Donald represent for you? Oh, I mean... I certainly have a, a couple Donalds in my life for sure. Um, Cocky, arrogant. Just like, well, I mean, he just like represents like the average per, you know, like there's so many people. And unfortunately that's, that's why what goes to show like talent is such a small fraction of what makes people successful in Hollywood is that the, and Donald kind of represents that of like the people that, you know, um, are so good at, being political campaign workers on social media, on Twitter, on Instagram, and just, uh, you know, just knowing how to work the room and, and, and just, uh, and, and promote self, self, like just shameless self-promotion. But then when you actually watch their work, mm-hmm. it's just like, it's so mediocre, yeah. if not terrible, you know? So, I mean, and, and he just represents, um, and it's and it. I just thought it was like really funny that like Emil Hirsch, who's, you know, arguably like one of my you know you know favorite actor. I mean, like he he's been in so many of my favorite films. He was mm-hmm. like a seminal actor for me in high school, and he was in he's been in so many of my favorite films. And I just thought it was funny that like such a great talent that's worked with such great directors like him is like playing this like you know <laughs> like kind of mediocre actor. Exactly, you know? exactly. One of my favorite scenes is a confrontation between Donald and I believe it was Nikki and uh, Petra. Uh, yeah. That scene where it gets really loud, confrontational, and then sort of the climax. Um, did those three understand what you were trying to what you were trying to accomplish with that scene? Uh, or did you have to really guide them into getting your vision for them to do exactly how you thought, saw it? Um, no, I, I think, I think they all, I think they all, um, I mean, Sarah Coffey, who played, um, the actress, the, the blonde actress that goes head to head with Emil, um, she, she was like, you know, 1000, she was a cause it was a big deal for her to, to do this. And, mm-hmm. uh, and she really, um. Um, she just, you know, she just, you know, 1000% committed to it. And she really wanted to, uh, cause she comes from, um, she's like a TikTok star. So she is hilarious. If you mm-hmm. watch her TikTok video, she does a lot of like hilarious TikTok videos, but, but she's, you know, she's a real actress. Um, and, uh, she hadn't really had much of an opportunity to like get that out because she just blew up on TikTok during the pandemic. And but she's always been a real actress. And it was the, one of the first times that she was able to really, um, uh, expose that and, uh, 
and going head to head with a, like a season pro, like Emil Hirsch was pretty exciting. And uh, what I loved so- about the most about that scene is uh, by the climax, she won up Donald. That's what I yeah. loved about it. She showed him, you yes, know, definitely. and I did not see that coming. Uh, now for this script in particular, did you have to do any kind of research into demonologists or any of that kind of stuff? Um, yeah, I, yeah, I did. I mean, I did like, you know, I mean, I didn't do like an extensive amount of research, um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I did, I mean, it was more like, um, kind of throughout 2020 when I was, uh, writing like first draft at least. And then from that point on, I was kind of just, uh, I mean, you know, there were, there were a lot of things that were made up, like the Malum Extractum is a made up book and, uh, Galvina, the Demon of Desires, like that's, that's made up. I mean, yeah. no, that stuff is based on truth and, uh, uh, maybe inspired, but, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I did a little research, but uh, but you know, it's I, but the, like the themes of the movie, I just were commercial. I, that it really doesn't involve a lot of deep diving in, into it. I mean, it's really out there, uh, just from ghost hunting shows and stuff like that. Uh, you know yeah, that we sure. can extract all that information. So I totally get it. Now, Eliza. Uh, really keeps the audience guessing throughout the whole film. What are her motivations? What are her intentions? Literally straight through to the end. And even in the ending, a lot of it is going to be left up to viewer interpretation without giving away any spoilers. Was that your intent or was the ending going to be your big reveal? This is what Eliza is and there's no a b or c other option um yeah i mean i i think it probably i mean even like based on the script i mean it was it was always pretty um it was always pretty like clear that it was going to be like you know kind of there could be like multiple different uh ways to interpret like how it wraps itself up and i i think uh and also like part of that climax just kind of uh just want to make a you know just kind of make a sort of like you know whacked out climax just for the entertainment sake of it all but um uh but yeah as far as like i mean you know i always thought that she was uh i i I don't know i look at the climax as like a happy ending you know like she like she like i i think like they're both they both come together Mm -hmm. uh and uh they're both uh going to a a better place and uh, i think uh, claims someone that um uh probably uh, has a tough time existing on earth and, uh, you know, I, I feel like they, uh, they, him and Eliza are uh, better off together in, you know, I guess the afterlife or, uh, or, or hell, if you want to. I could see that. that. I could see yeah. that. What kind of broke my heart was the, the scene before the credits, the actual audition, when he obviously doesn't show up and the people auditioning sort of reveal that he had something special. And yeah. it's sad because he went through his entire life not knowing that he actually did have talent and he just needed that break and it, you know and that was that was a great yeah. way to end the film because it left the viewers yeah. like wow damn if this guy only knew now one last question we're almost out of time there's a scene where the crucifixion is recreated what was the important well, why was that scene so important to put into the story um, well, originally he was going to be like lying on the floor, um, like strapped on the floor. Um, and, uh, and just for logistics sake, it just, for the camera, it just made more sense for him just to be like standing up and more like a, like a crucifix. And, uh, and I mean, yeah, they, those are, that's just like one of like many, like fun kind of Easter eggs put in like religious kind of Easter eggs put in throughout the film that like, you know, okay. do they have like a direct significance to the plot itself? I mean, yes and no, it's just, uh. It's just kind of like nice little imagery to put in throughout the movie uh, to touch on that kind of stuff. Um, and it worked. And made, yeah, yeah. It really worked. Well, Chris, I want to thank you so much for coming on here and sharing your experiences writing this and directing it. For our viewers, again, the movie's called Devil's Workshop. He's being released in theaters and video on demand uh, in two days, uh, Friday, yep. September 30th. So go check it out. It's fun, it's entertaining, it's scary, it's creepy, it's a little bit of everything. Do you have any final thoughts you want to share before we go, Chris? Uh, no, yeah, I just, uh, yeah, I just hope that people like, uh, 
I, I hope that people are able to find that satire in the movie because I, I, I certainly think it's there. And I think, uh, yeah. and you know, it's a horror film for sure. But uh, but I think, uh, uh, it, I, you know, I, I hope that the people find more than more than that. And yeah. Not to sound like I, I don't want to sound pretentious about it. It is a horror film, but like. You know, I, I just hope that they find a little bit more than that. It, the there's more to it than just a horror film. I, I totally yeah. understand what you're saying. I want to thank our audience, those of you who are tuning in live, and those of you who will be watching this later on. Again, thank you to our guest, Chris Van Hoffman. On behalf of Chris and myself, stay safe and stay walking. Good night, guys. Cool. Thank you. <laughs>